<laughs> okay, before I actually get into that, I wanted to tie up a loose end from last time, and that is the question came up, how can you make a set point uh, for homeostasis? Basically, how can you encode what target value some property should be? And uh, I don't think I answered that very, very well, so I went back and looked around. And in most cases, we, in most homeostatic processes, we don't really know the molecular details of how a set point is defined, but here is how it could work in principle. And so uh, before I get into this pretty abstract schematic, let me just talk about the molecular reality of how this could actually happen. So let's, let's think about, remember I talked about synaptic scaling where you increase or decrease the strength of excitatory synapses and that happens a lot by, uh, by manipulating the, uh, the number of available receptor channels in the postsynaptic membrane. And so there are, um, these are just two of probably many different ways in which you can uh, change or regulate the number of available channels in the postsynaptic membrane. So one scenario is that you have a channel molecule inserted in the membrane, but it's not functional. It's, it's closed in, at this point, and it only becomes functional, a functional receptor channel if it gets phosphorylated. And then there would be a kinase that does that phosphorylation and a phosphatase that dephosphorylates and you arrive at some equilibrium be between the two. And in the schematic that we'll look at in a moment, this would be the plus factor and this would be the minus factor. And together they establish a balance of how many uh, functional re receptor channels do you have available. Another way to look at it, and, and this is actually in, in the actual synaptic scaling that Gina Torgiano studies, we know that um, insertion and removal of postsynaptic receptor channels plays a big role. So that would be another way to, to play with that number of channels is that you have a factor that inserts new channels into the membrane and another factor that removes them. And, and again, the insertion and removal pathways will arrive at some kind of equilibrium. And so now the idea is that, uh, let me get the pointer now. The idea is that you can set up a set point based on such pairs of factors. So let's assume you have a firing rate and uh, that firing rate inside the cell could, for example, be encoded by the intracellular calcium concentration like I was explaining on Wednesday. And if these factors here, factor plus and factor minus, which could be the kinase phosphatase pair or the insertion and removal pathways, uh, if they are now dependent on the calcium concentration or the firing rate, you can actually set up a set point. So let's, let's look at what this uh, curve is suggesting. And again, this is kind of just a, uh, an, a basic idea of how you can use the existing molecular machinery to do this, but in many cases we don't know how it actually happens. So if, if you're, uh, if your plus factor, your kinase or your insertion pathway, if its activity is dependent on the calcium concentration in this direction, and if the other one is dependent in this direction, then you, you get just like, you get a unique calcium concentration or firing rate at which the two are in, in equilibrium. And so that would basically establish a set point, right? So if your firing rate for some reason becomes higher, your calcium concentration becomes higher and this removal or phos phosphorylation, dephosphorylation pathway will, um, will become stronger and, and that will bring you back to the set point and vice versa if you're over here. But doesn't this just push the problem back a level? Because now you, the question is how do you get set points in factor plus and factor minus? Because if they change, your set point will change. Right. So, um, the way the figure and the paper presents it is it's actually not seeing it as pushing back a problem, but now opening a door for adjusting a set point. But I, I kind of agree, like you still then have to understand, well, what now regulates the, how, ma how much kinase is there and how much phosphatase is there? So in a sense, it's, it, I agree, it's pushing back the problem a little bit, but uh, you know, at some point maybe you arrive at a point where it's, it's genetically encoded, you know, maybe 
maybe it's kind of set how much of that kinase you have and how much of that phosphatase you have, and that establishes a set point for your cell. But uh, as you already pointed out, now this set point can now be moved if you, if you now, like this, this kinase here is itself a molecule and has a concentration in the cell. And so if something now comes in and decreases the co that concentration, you just basically scale down that curve and you can move your set point around. But I mean, it, it has, I think it, it has some explanatory value in that it kind of demystifies a little bit what is that magic set point that in the math we just put in the equation. But I agree, like ultimately you're one level further back and then you have to figure out, well, what determines the balance of these two, of these two factors? Yes? Um, so one question about set points is that they are kept often uh, astonishingly precise over a long period of time. And uh, so the question is, uh, can you from the slope of this curve uh, maybe make some kind of statements on the um, how stable that is. Yeah, the precision, yeah. yeah. And, and arrow, uh, the, the, the slow slopes, then it will not really increase the precision, but if you have, uh, the parameters can increase the precision if they are very steep. Yeah. I, I completely agree that uh, those slopes will determine like over what range of calcium concentrations mm -hmm. can that set point vary, but, but we also have to, uh, I, I just want to emphasize again, this is just a very abstract schematic, right? Even the shape of those curves doesn't necessarily have to look like that. But as long as you have a, a monotonically decreasing and a monotonically increasing dependence like that of two, of two antagonistic factors, basically, you'll, you'll get some kind of equilibrium point. And then, yeah, I think anything further than that precision and things like that will then depend on exactly what is the implementation. I also, when you started your question, I thought, oh, he's going to go, he's going to go oopy on me. He's going to talk about, he's going to talk about small numbers of molecules. And um, so this is, you know, this is showing a nice smooth curve here. But if oopy is right and your calcium concentration is really pretty low, and so then all of this could be could become much more noisy too, right? So it's just I just wanted to bring this up to kind of show that in principle, with the molecular machinery that exists in the cell, you can you can relatively easily create a set point like that. Okay, so now let's move into the uh, parameter variability and uh, ensemble modeling part. So again. I just wanted to put this up as a reminder. A lot of what I'll be talking about is in the pyloric system of uh, the crab or lobster, and you have this three node pacemaker circuit, uh, pattern generating circuit with a pacemaker kernel that oscillates rhythmically, and two types of follower neurons that also oscillate in response to inhibition from the pacemaker. And so this will just serve as a reminder of what circuit we're talking about. So um, we saw a little bit last time, and there was even a question about that, that there is variability in the properties of these neurons. Even though we're talking about identified neurons that basically you can find the same neuron in every animal, it generates the same rhythmic activity, it innervates the same <coughs> muscles, and it has the same synapses with partners. The, the, the properties of these neurons can vary pretty widely. And so here's an example of that. So here is a pacemaker neuron and another neuron in the pyloric circuit. And we're looking at the maximal conductance. So in a sense, you can think about it, how many ion channels of a given type are in that neuron's membrane for three different types of potassium currents. So these are, they're all potassium currents. This is the A-type potassium current, which is an inactivating potassium current. This is a calcium dependent potassium current and this is the delayed rectifier that repolarizes your action potential. And each data point here is from one animal in the same, in the same pacemaker neuron or in the same other neuron. And you see that from animal to animal, you don't always find the same value but you get ranges of values and they can typically uh, range two to three to four fold 
or even five-fold between different animals, even though those cells are generating the exact same electrical activity. So there is uh, parameter variability, and it's not just maximal conductances of ion channels, and it's not just in the somatogastric ganglion, so I kind of put together a little collection of examples of parameter variability. So here again, we're looking at the pyloric circuit, but now we're looking at the uh, conductances of synapses, so how strong are these inhibitory synapses in the circuit? Here is the synapse from the pacemaker to the LP neuron. This is the synapse from the, I, I said earlier the pacemaker actually consists of two different cell types, AB and PD, so you can break this down into the AB component and the PD component onto L, LP, and you see that both the the total synapse, uh, synapse strength of both components together and each component individually also is variable and again you get like, for example, this one here goes from let's say 25 to 150 so you get a several fold range um, of that same synapse strength between different animals. Um, now, when we're talking about synapses, um, that gets us to something that is kind of a hot topic uh, recently, and that is the connectome and the claim by some people that basically everything a neural network does and everything that you do is basically determined by, the, by your synapse strengths. And um, uh, uh, this, uh, to me, already kind of puts kind of a, a little bit of a perspective on that. And, and one example that, that always comes up is that people say, well, you have C. elegans where we have the complete connectome and we know exactly how everything is connected. But if you actually go into the literature and you look it up, um, here is data from a comparison of data from two indi individual worms, two uh, specimen of C. elegans, and it turns out that actually not even in terms of strength, but even in terms of the existence of a given synapse, only 75% of the synapses that exist in one animal actually also exist in the other animal. So we're definitely not talking about a kind of cookie cutter connectome that's exactly the same in every worm. So there's variability even in the existence of particular synapses, not just in their strength. Um, this is just an, uh, Another figure again showing that conductance variability in stomatogastric neurons, and here are a couple of other examples. This is from, from guinea pig cochlear neurons, so neurons in, in the guinea pig ear. They vary both in terms of their, uh, their um, so here we're looking again at, at a potassium current and the threshold of activation of that current varies. Um, it's, it's slope conductance, which is a kind of a, a measure for the amplitude of that current also varies several fold. Here we're looking from a colleague of mine at Emory, Ron Calabrese, we're looking at the strength of inhibitory synapses between leech heart interneurons. They vary several fold, even though these are also identified neurons. And this is from um, uh, mouse Purkinje neurons that you've heard about several times now. The, cerebellar neurons with that flat dendritic arbor, and you see there that Purkinje neurons that generate very similar electrical activity um, can have pretty different sodium current and calcium current amplitudes. So I would say that this parameter variability, despite very similar output, is, is kind of a ubiquitous thing. And um, so what does that mean and how do we deal with that when we try to build models? But before I want to get into those questions, I want to do a little bit of terminology, and that is um, because I want you to, to kind of follow what I'm trying to say, and, and also because some people are kind of real murky about how they use different terms. And I think that we, when we talk about these things, we should try to be clear and consistent about what we call things. And so I would argue that it's useful to distinguish between three different types of descriptors of a dynamical system, for example, a neuron or a neuronal network. One thing is parameters. So those are kind of fixed properties of that system. I'm talking about something like morphology or the maximal conductance for a sodium current or the membrane capacitance, basically things that 
These things can change over longer time scales, but for the purposes of what we're looking at at the moment, they are kind of fixed entities. They are parameters that, in a sense, that you put into your model or that the biological system establishes during development, and then that's, that's a fixed value. That's what I call a parameter. Uh, in contrast to that, you have variables or dynamic variables, and those are things like the membrane potential, the calcium concentration, the, the gating variables of different ion channels. Basically, anything that you describe with a differential equation, that's what I call a variable, and that's different from a parameter. So those are the things that change over time and that show the interesting temporal dynamics. And then there's things that also change over time. I'm thinking about, for example, the firing rate of a neuron or what else could this be? Um, yeah, firing rate is the best example that comes to mind right now. So these are basically descriptors of what the neuron does. Uh, and they're also changing over time, so it's easy to maybe confuse them with dynamic variables, but there's not a differential equation that describes the firing rate, right? It's an outcome of, of uh, several dynamic variables taken together. And so I'm going to try to be really consistent and distinguish these things. The, the most abused term, I think, is parameters. Like a lot of people use parameters for anything, basically. and. Uh, and uh, I, I just think it's useful to distinguish these things. So try to catch me using a term wrong and uh, maybe that'll p make you pay attention. It can happen. So again, so we, ha we now have this uh, parameter variability. So these I call parameters because for the purposes of what we're looking at today, they are constant numbers. And uh, how do you deal with that? So let's say we want to build a model neuron now to describe to describe uh, these stomatogastric neurons. The model neuron that I'm going to be using in the rest of today is a single compartment uh, conductance-based model neuron. So the single compartment is this blob here. It has int intracellularly a model of a calcium buffer and it has eight different membrane conductances that are all um, that are all uh, based on measurements in biological neurons. So there's a, your regular fast sodium current that makes your action potential upstroke. Then there's two different calcium currents. Um, we've already seen these different potassium currents here. These three we already saw before. There is also the H current that we heard about a couple days ago. So the hyperpolarization activated current and a, a simple leak current. And for all of these, we have, uh, based on voltage clamp experiments in stomatogastric neurons, we basically have a, par a parameterization that is a description of their dynamics and how they depend on voltage. And um, we won't get too much into equations like this, but just for those of you who do this kind of modeling, a reminder, and for those of you who don't, just kind of also a reminder, I guess, how complex, even a simple single model neuron like that can be. So we basically have a master equation here that describes how the membrane potential changes as a function of all the currents, all the membrane currents in the neuron. Then each of these membrane currents, that's why it says times eight here, is described by, uh, by these Hodgkin-Huxley type dynamics with activation and inactivation variables that have half activation thresholds and that have time constants. And then there's also um, a, a simple kind of intracellular calcium buffer. And so you see that there's lots of, these are now parameters. So these are fixed numbers that we plug into these equations. The half activation voltage here or um, the, the reversal potential here. So these are, these are now parameters that if we want to model this neuron, we have to supply a number for each of these. And I already told you, for a lot of those, we have numbers based on voltage clamp experiments. So, so we can say the reversal potential for the sodium current is, you know, 50 millivolts plus minus a few millivolts or something. Most of these are not all that variable. So most of these are relatively narrowly constrained. But what is not narrowly constrained, and we just saw that before, what's not narrowly constrained is how many, uh, what's the maximal conductance of these particular currents? So how many ion channels of that type are in the membrane? 
So I'm charging you with building this model. I'm giving you the, the differential equations with all those parameters that are relatively well known and constrained. But now you need to pick what are the maximal conductances. So based on this experimental information, what are you going to do? So let's say for this A current in this pacemaker neuron, what value are you going to pick for your mono neuron? I'm not trying to entrap you here, just what would be your first, first order approach? I'm asking you for a number. Are you going to make it this or this? What, what number are you going to pick as your first shot? That's an easy question. The me median or average, right? Yeah, somewhere in there, right? That's the, and that's a totally, you know, that's the obvious first thing you always do. If you have a spread of something, you, you want to condense it down into one number, you take the average or the mean or something. And uh, people do that over and over. And sometimes it works, but often they find if they plug those numbers into their model and they simulate the model and they look at what does it do, it doesn't do anything or it, you know, it sits there silent when it should be bursting. So usually that doesn't work and I want to spend just one slide on explaining what about these complex systems can lead to that kind of what's called failure of averaging. So let me here. So this is from a, a really interesting paper. I don't have the reference here, but it came out of the lab of Larry Abbott. And so what they did is they basically had a simple model neuron. It was actually a simplified version of the stomatogastric model neuron that we're dealing with here. And they basically, they varied these maximal conductances of different ion, ion, ionic currents. So here's the sodium and the delayed rectifier potassium current. But they had, I think, five or six different currents, not the eight that I, I'm going to be working with. And they varied all of them. And we're looking here just at everything projected onto this two-dimensional plane, right? Really, it's a six or five-dimensional thing, but they projected it all onto this plane. And every colored dot here is one version of the model with you know, this particular combination of these two conductances and then some values for the other conductances. And what's color coded here, and so for each of these parameter choices, which they picked randomly by just randomly varying these, uh, these parameters, for each of them they looked at what is the output. So they simulated the model with those parameters and they asked what does it do. And the color code here just uh, stands for basically the output of the model neuron and uh, what's color coded is the number of spikes per burst. So a lot of these will generate these kind of rapid bursts of action potential zoomed in here in time. And the color tells you how many spikes are in a burst. Um, zero, I guess, means that it's a silent neuron, although I don't see that many here. One means that it, it makes this kind of uh, activity with like one spike and then a shoulder. And then two and three and four and five is additional spikes. And the point they're making here is, imagine you had an experimental population of neurons that all generate this kind of activity, this uh, spike with a shoulder. Like for example, these three guys here, one, two, three, their activity is very similar, both in the shape of the, of the shoulder and also in the overall spike rate. And in, in this particular example here, where are these three located? Number one is here, number two is here, and number three is here. So imagine you had an experimental population like this and you measure the delayed rectifier and you measure the sodium and now you're trying to build a model to replicate this kind of thing. If you now take, take the average uh, put a delayed rectifier concentration and the, all these blue guys are also in this category. If you take their average delayed rectifier uh, G max maximal conductance, you end up with this value here. If you take their average sodium, you end up with this value. And so you're going to place your model, if you use those two averages in this point here, and you'll, you're going to fall outside of the distribution that actually produces this activity. So this is actually the activity you will get if you use those two averages here. Um, so it's different from what you, what, what you were trying to achieve. 
And you see why this is happening, right? It's because this distribution of these, um, of these spike plus shoulder guys is, is kind of concave here and is hugging the axes. And so your average actually falls outside the distribution itself. And that's actually something that we're seeing a lot, that distributions of parameter combinations that produce similar activity can often have a non-trivial shape in the parameter space and often a, a non-convex non shape. So it's not a nice blob where the average is smack in the middle of the ranges, but it's, it's some complicated shape where averaging will not get you anywhere. So for this and many other reasons, and mainly because we were interested in, well, what does this variability of parameters despite similar output, what does that mean? We, we said we want to kind of just take this really naive approach and, and just systematically and with brute force explore uh, a parameter space of this model neuron and basically just ask if we, if we simulate this model neuron, again, here's the reminder what it is, if we simulate it for many, many different combinations of these maximal conductances, what what kinds of activity do we get and how do they, how does that activity depend on the particular combination of parameters that we chose? So here's the very naive approach. We basically say, okay, we have these eight parameters here. These are the maximal conductances for the eight different currents and we're going to vary each of them from zero to some physiologically <laughs> reasonable value that we know based on experiments in fixed increments and so here's, uh, so we're, we're dealing with an eight dimensional parameter space. Here we're showing three because that's all I can do on a two dimensional thing. And, um, and basically the idea is we just cover this eight dimensional space with a regular grid of simulation points and for each of them we ask what does it do. And again I want to emphasize that that's varying eight parameters, but there's a lot that we're keeping constant between those different versions, right? We're not changing anything about the voltage dependence of the, these activation and inactivation gates or about their time constants. We're leaving all of that constant. And uh, we can talk later about why that is. I already said that these things are in biology much less variable from animal to animal. So that's a good reason for varying these but not these. But there are also computational reasons you, you can imagine that or you, you, it's Im immediately obvious that every additional parameter that you add, every additional dimension just makes this number of combinations here explode, right? And so eight at the time when we did this, uh, almost 10 years ago now, God, uh, was kind of computationally what we were willing to wait for on a, on a computer cluster that obviously becomes more and more feasible for larger numbers of parameters, but there is a limit, right? If we varied all parameters of this, of this uh, model, in which I think it's like 50 or 60 parameters, you know, you'd wait a couple hundred years on your computer cluster for that to finish up. Okay, so in this particular case, we have eight parameters that we vary through six different values each, which uh, is a 1.7 million version um, data set and we basically for each of them simulate what does it do, have an automatic classification scheme and save all of that information in a database and that's what we call the model neuron database. Okay, so what do you get when you do that? So here are a couple of examples. On the right you see um, these bars indicate for, for the different maximal conductances, how much of each was in that particular version of the model neuron. And uh, on the left is the voltage trace produced by that parameter combination. And you see you can get, just by mixing the, the relative concentrations of these ion channels, you can get lots of different types of activity. So silence, nothing happens. You can get a spiker. But here we know that this is not a regular, a normal spiker, but it's a calcium spiker because it actually has no sodium. It has no sodium uh, current. This one is one that uh, also spikes, but it does it mostly with its sodium current. You get these guys like we just saw with a single spike and then a broad shoulder. 
you get what we're basically looking for when we try to model a stomatogastric neuron, this, these nice kind of burst patterns. You can get non-periodic stuff. Even though we have no noise included in this model here, you still can get uh, non-periodic behaviors. And we get these weird guys that I later found out, at first I thought that's totally pathological, but later I found out these are called hyperbolic bursters and they actually, there are some exotic cell types that actually show this kind of behavior. Um, so then like I said, we have an automatic classification scheme that online actually as it's simulating is, uh, is grouping them into four broad categories, so silent, tonically spiking, bursting, and then non-periodic. And it's kind of a technical aside, but the kind of one of the tricky things in setting up an automated uh, database like that is I, I basically most of my time I spend programming to make sure that each individual version of the model was simulated for the minimum amount of time that would allow me to to uh, accurately classify it. Right? You, if, you have a, if you have something like this, you, you're probably going to have to run it for quite a while until you have convinced yourself there's no periodicity in there. But if you, if you have something like this, you know, after, after five or ten spikes, it's pretty clear this thing is, is spiking like clockwork, so you don't have to simulate a, a really long time. And so that way you can kind of have a balance between the, the amount of time you need for each individual version and, um, and still have an accurate classification and, and that really minimizes the overall simulation time as opposed to just running everything for 60 seconds or something. Okay, so now in this particular case we were looking for parameter combinations that would produce something that looks like a stomatogastric neuron, in particular somatogastric pacemaker. And so our first thing was to look at this uh, database overall and look at how does it break down. And uh, uh, luckily or maybe not luckily because we chose the parameters in physiological ranges, what we ended up was about two-thirds uh, bursting neurons. So that was useful. And then a bunch of spiking and silent and a few non-periodic ones. And the, Bursts are further broken down here by number of spikes per burst. So a first thing you can then do with uh, a database like this is basically just use it to find parameter sets that do a particular thing. Right before I told you if you build your model from scratch, you put in your average parameters from your experiments, you will usually end up with something that doesn't work and then the traditional thing and that is uh, done a lot and it's totally legitimate is that you then start hand tuning and using your common sense and adjusting parameters to get, get it to the point where it does what you want it to do. Here you can be more stupid and you don't need any common sense. You just go in the database and say, give me everybody who does this or that. And so now we're going to look for in this database for models that generate this kind of bursting pacemaker activity just as one example of what you can look for in a database like that. So we start out with all, uh, with the entire database, 1.7 million. We then say we're only looking at the bursters. Uh, we want the period to be in kind of a physiological range for these somatogastric neurons. Brings us down to 200,000 versions. Then uh, we want the burst duration to be reasonable. We want the duty cycle to be reasonable. Duty cycle is the fraction of the period that's taken up by the burst. Um, and so now we're down to a pretty small number now, 80, 80 versions out of these 1.7 million. And then we applied a couple additional constraints. There's a thing called the phase response curve which describes how an oscillator responds to inputs at different times in its cycle. That narrowed it down. And then an important parameter is kind of this slow wave amplitude of slow voltage oscillation that underlies the spiking. And now we're down to just nine neurons out of 1.7 million. And uh, uh, yes? Had any of those nine previously been kind of manually designed before? Or were they completely new? That is a good question. You know, I never went and compared those nine. I compared them to each other, but I actually never went and compared them to a hand-tuned version. That's a good point. I should uh, 
look at that. I would suspect that they are probably in the range of a hand-tuned version, and that is because when I compared them between uh, to each other, it turned out, and we'll see much more of that later, it turned out that they were not all over the place, but they were kind of in a neighborhood of the of the parameter space. And so I would assume that any any other combination that does similar activity would also be in that neighborhood. So here's just uh, one example. So here's again our biological activity voltage here. And this is one of those nine pacemakers, the voltage trace. And here's the phase response curve. I won't get into what this means. One thing I, as an aside, I haven't talked about this there's obviously a striking difference between the biological and the model neuron here, right? The spikes are tiny here. They're just, they're just like 10 millivolts, whereas these are your usual nice overshooting uh, action potentials. And that just comes, that's unavoidable with this kind of model. That comes from the fact that we have modeled these as single compartment. So all the conductances, including the ones that make the action potential, are in that single compartment. Whereas in the biological neuron, you have the cell body and the spikes are actually initiated pretty far away in the dendrite. And so what you, in the biological neurons, what you measure at the cell body with your electrode is really just an attenuated echo of, of the action potential. And uh, there are now, there are more refined models with two or four or even more compartments of of these stomato same stomatogastric neurons where you then separate the, the, the spiking currents, the sodium and the delayed rectifier, and put them into a remote compartment. And then you get, you get this kind of activity at the cell body. You get your spike initiation zone with the nice overshooting spikes and your attenuated spikes at the cell body. So this is not something we can ever achieve with these single compartment uh, ones. But for the purposes, that, that again gets us to the discussion yesterday, last night, like well, how should you model things for the purposes uh, of this database and the things we wanted to achieve with it, this didn't matter to us, this spatial, this, the fact that we had lumped everything into a single compartment. For other questions, you, you do need that spatial resolution, right? Okay, so what are those nine models now? So here are their um, individual conductances. Um, I'm, showing, I'm not showing all eight of them because some of them were the same through all nine. And uh, you see that they can vary, right? So here's the sodium. The smallest is 100 millisiemens per square centimeter, which is a conductance density. And the largest is 400, so you have a four-fold range. And similarly for some of these others, and so another way to express that is to, uh, to look at the coefficient of variation. That's the standard deviation over the mean. And you typically get like 0 0.3, 0 0.4, something in that range. And just to compare that back to what I showed you before, the experimentally observed range, we're in the same ballpark in terms of coefficients of variation. So that to me was reassuring. So it basically says that we find similar electrical activity on the basis of variable parameters, both in the biological neurons and in the model neurons. So this was all single cell level so far. So now the question was, does this message of similar behavior from different parameters also apply at the network level? So now we're basically doing the same exercise, constructing a model neuron, a model network database now by brute force exploration, but we're doing it at the network level. So this is your network again. And what we're doing now is we're, we're going to explore a 10-dimensional parameter space. We have three, three cells and we're going to, in a moment I'm going to show you um, cell models that we can plug into this position or this position or this position. And then we have seven synapses here in the circuit all inhibitory and for each of them we're going to vary the strength of the synapse from zero, so basically no synapse present, all the way to saturation. So a really strong synapse and what I mean by saturation is if you make your synaptic conductance, which is a measure for the strength of the synapse, if you make it very, very strong, 
then if the presynaptic neuron is active, the postsynaptic neuron will basically be clamped to the synaptic reversal potential. That synapse will totally suck the membrane potential to the synaptic reversal potential and you can make the synapse stronger than that. You can make it 10 times or 100 times stronger than that. It will, that's all it can do. It can never go beyond the synaptic reversal. So that's basically functional saturation. So that's a huge range and we thought, well, we kind of know roughly how strong these synapses are. I showed you before some data that showed that they're variable, but they're in, in some range. So should we really make them zero to really strong? But then we thought, let's just see what happens and uh, you'll see that there are some interesting outcomes of that. Okay, so what are those neurons that we plug into these individual positions? Um, these are the models that we plug into the pacemaker position. There are five different ones of them and they're basically just picked out of those nine that I showed you before and I picked them to make them as diverse as possible in their conductances. So I said that they're all in a neighborhood but I basically picked them to be at the edges of the neighborhood to cover some range. And then from the same database that I showed you before from a single neuron database we can select models for the follower neurons for the lateral pyloric and pyloric neuron. Again, based on what we know about their isolated behavior in the biological system. So we know that if you isolate them from the rhythmic inhibition that they get from the pacemaker, they will be either silent or tonically spiking. So they don't burst in themselves. They only burst if you repeatedly inhibit them. So we picked you know, silent and spiking ones and then we gave them one burst of inhibition from the pacemaker and we required that they made a nice rebound burst which, because that's what the biological neurons do and with, certain, you know, with a certain delay, a um, couple of different criteria that we use to pick follower neuron models similar to what the biological ones do. When did I start? At uh, 11 something? 11.10 or something. Yeah, I'm, uh, I probably again have more slides than I can cover but the story toward the end is kind of modular so we can easily drop some of the parts. Okay, so here's our database now. We're putting all of these together. That makes 20 million models now and again we have all everything automated so in an automated way we detect is this thing rhythmically active at all? If it is, what are the what's the period, what are the burst durations, what are phase relationships and all of that and that all gets dumped into a database and uh, we can then look at what's the outcome and here are just uh, 10 examples just to give you a sense of what can happen. So in the top row you have uh, networks that use the same model neurons but have different synaptic strengths and they're indicated here by, uh, by these, the size of and color of these blobs and here you have the same synaptic connectivity but uh, now you're, we're using different models in, in these different positions. And you can see that a lot can go wrong. We're trying to get this triphasic rhythm that the biological system generates. A lot can go wrong. So here you have cases where um, some of the neurons are silent and some are tonically active. There's no bursting going on here. Or you can get cases where Everybody is kind of bursty, but some of them are really more irregular, are not really as regular as we would like them to be. You can get cases where, you know, one of them skips every other cycle. You can get cases where everybody bursts, but the order is wrong, right? You want, you want the same order as in the biological circuit, which is, um, LPPYPD, LPPYPD, and, uh, and in this case you have LPPDPY, so wrong, wrong triphasic order. But in, on the right here, there are some exam two examples where it, everything's triphasic and they're in the right order. So these we then called pyloric like. They're rhythmic in the right order. So that's a start. And uh, it turned out that there were actually, I was surprised, there were actually 20% of the entire database were pyloric like like that. And why do I say I'm, I'm surprised? I said that we varied each individual synapse over this huge range when we know that the actual biological range is probably much smaller. And so c kind of just in a comb combinatorial way you would expect that there would be many, many cases where one or the other or several synapses are way out of their range uh, 
and it falls apart, but still we got 20%. So that was encouraging, like this had originally been my plan, like to go this far and then say, let's analyze this thing. But then we said, well then maybe we can go a little more refined and uh, be really demanding and not just require rhythmicity and tr the right triphasic order, but, but uh, require a much better match with biology. And so to do that, we established a set of 15 criteria to describe the output characteristics of these networks, to describe the rhythms. See how I'm not calling these parameters, I'm calling these output characteristics. And um, so what are those? The most straightforward one, period. Then we have burst durations for each of the neurons. We have delays, which is time from this onset to this onset, then gaps, which is the time the, between the end here and the start, and then duty cycles, I already said that's the ratio between the burst duration and the period, and uh, phase relationships, so that's uh, the ratio of a delay over the period. So different, different ways of describing this rhythm, and uh, Dirk Bucher here, who was a postdoc at the same time with me in Eve Martyr's lab and he now has his own lab in Florida. He uh, did the painstaking thing of going back into lots of old recordings from the lab because what everybody does is when they take a somatogastric uh, nervous system and place it in the dish, the first thing they do is they record the rhythm before they do any manipulation. So there's lots of baseline data and he went back and plowed through a hundred of these uh, old recordings and extracted the biological range for each of these 15 criteria that I just told you about, period, burst duration, and so on. And so, um, and, uh, th so that created basically an experimental database that we then published. And here's just, uh, are some examples of the biological ranges. So here's the cycle period. Each dot here is an animal and you see the cycle period is pretty variable, goes from a little over one to a little over two seconds here. Um, that get, kind of gets to, um, I think it may have been you or someone else was asking the question, how variable are these things? Uh, was it you? Yeah, we saw, we saw before I showed you that in their parameters, some parameters like half activation thresholds and time constants are a little variable. Some parameters are very variable, like the maximal conductances. And now we see the same thing in the output features. Some are very variable. The cycle period, that's pretty variable, and that's under the same conditions, same temperature and everything. But other things are more tightly constrained. So what we're looking at here is the phase of different events in the cycle. So what are those events? So PD off is when um, so we defined phase zero as the beginning of the PD, the pyloric dilator um, burst. Oh, it's shown up here. Phase zero is what we define here. And then phase, the PD off phase is the fraction of the period at which the burst ends. So that is about 0.4. And then the same for when does the LP burst start and end, and when does the PY burst start and end. And you see that even though the cycle period varies pretty widely, these phases, on and offset phases of the bursts are much more narrowly constrained. And people uh, talk about this a lot. I think this tells us probably a lot about what the circuit really cares about. It doesn't seem to matter so much how, and again, as a reminder, this is uh, moving filters in the stomach. So it's, it's uh, activating a couple of antagonistic muscles that move the stomach wall and that moves a filtering system that passes small food particles for further digestion and throws back big food particles for further chewing. And so it doesn't seem to matter how quickly you do that, but you want the right phase relationships. You don't want your antagonistic muscles to be active at the same time and you cramp up or something. So, so that tells you something about what is, what is probably the desired function of this circuit. We'll, we'll, we'll see a lot of that later on, yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going really slow here, but 
um, I'd, you know, I'd rather go in depth and you follow this stuff and we lose some of the finer details at the end rather than going like way over your head. Okay, so we have this experimental database to constrain um, those 15 uh, criteria that characterize a rhythm. So for each of these criteria, we now have a mean plus minus standard deviation from the biology. And if we now go into, the, into those 20% pyloric-like networks and we filter out only the ones that fall in the biological range for all 15 criteria, then we're down to 2.2% of the database, which is a small fraction, but again, we varied the synapses very widely, very widely, it's hard to say for our German. And, uh, but 2.2% uh, because we started out with 20 million is still 450,000 different versions of this network that generate a physiologically reasonable rhythm. And here are two examples, model network one and two with the voltage traces. And here are some cellular properties and some synaptic properties from these two particular networks. And the point is just that, just like with the single cells or maybe even to a bigger extent than in the single cells, we see variability in these cellular and synaptic parameters. So I'm just going to pick two examples this one has a big sodium current in the PY neuron. Here it's pretty small. And uh, this one has a large, a strong synapse from the pacemaker to the lateral pyloric neuron. And here it's pretty weak. So you again have basically this message of similar, highly biologically constrained output on the basis of different parameters. And um, this is just, I was particularly interested in the synapses because we had varied them so widely and I had expected that to produce many more failures. And so here, is, here are these pyloric networks, so those 450,000 narrowly constrained ones. And it's a histogram of these over each of the synapses. So over the strength of this synapse, strength of this synapse, strength of this synapse, and so on. And, uh, so here you see how, how widely each of these synaptic strengths was varied. I didn't say this before. In the single cell database, we used like a regular, regularly spaced grid of conductance values with the synapses because I had fiddled around a little bit and done some pilot stuff. We actually varied it more on a kind of a semi-logarithmic scale because it, uh, it seemed like if a synapse is small, then a small change is more interesting than if it's already big, right? So often with, if you do an exploration like this, it makes sense to first do a little bit of fiddling around and playing around and figuring out how do you want to vary these different things. And with the exception of this synapse here, which apparently needs to be pretty weak in order for a network to be successful, all the other synapses cover the entire range from zero to the maximum saturating strength. So to me, that was really surprising. And so we asked, well, can we, so, so we have a, a huge range in, for almost all of these synapses. Can, what if we, if we narrow ourselves down, not just to the biological range of these 15 different features, but what if we carve out subsets of that? And so one thing we tried was to say, what if we pick out only the fastest few percent, uh, the fastest couple hundred networks out of these, or a, a narrow range in the middle of, in terms of period, or only the slowest ones, how does it break down then? And you see that still most, most of the synapses cover the full range. And uh, there's a lot of interesting information in here, in here that we analyzed, but I won't get into it. But for example, here you see that apparently there's some relationship between the strength of this pacemaker to lateral pyloric synapse and the period you can achieve. If it's weak, you tend to be faster. You, you go slower uh, if it's stronger. So there's a lot of information in here that I won't get into. And uh, interestingly to me also, again, in the context of that whole connectome discussion where it's like the connectivity determines everything and is so important. Well, here we, I, I'm not, I'm maybe being too glib here. I think it is very important, but I think one, at least one person who is very prominently um, 
pushing that idea who is, uh, that Sebastian Sung, I think he's kind of totally neglecting the fact that there's also a lot of processing going on in the cellular properties. It's not just the synapses, it also matters what the cells are doing. But uh, in any case, so what we notice here is that out of those 2% uh, of those 450,000 highly functional networks, if we look at what synapses do they actually have, only less than half of them have all, all uh, connections present and there are some where one of the connections is missing. So here this one is missing and here this one is missing. And then there are some where two of them are missing and then there's even a very small uh, fraction where they get by with just inhibition from the pacemaker to, to, the, um, to the follower neurons but no talking between them and no feedback. So that's like the very basic, if you don't have that, then these follower neurons won't be rhythmic, right? They will just be tonic or silent. So that's the minimum you need. And even, even with that, you can, uh, if everything else is right, you can generate that rhythm. So, okay, so this is going to wrap up the, the kind of core that I absolutely wanted to get across and then we can go into, into some other related points. So what I absolutely wanted to get across is that there is parameter non-uniqueness both in biology and we can mimic that in the models. So parameter non-uniqueness non means there is not just one point in parameter space that the system has to sit in and only then can it function properly but there, you seem to be able to do the job with a wide range of different parameters. And so that gets us to this concept of a solution space. So now the idea is that you have this eight or 10 or however dimensional parameter space and the, the solutions now, these functional parameter combinations are somewhere in that space. And so we call that sub part of the entire space now the solution space. That's the parameter sets that allow you to function properly. And it also um, gets me to this idea that I put in the title this idea of ensemble modeling. So you see that we now basically end up with, instead of a single version of a model that we study and where we can switch one thing on and off and see how, what are the mechanisms that determine the behavior, now we have an, a whole ensemble of models. And so I think of this as kind of the model equivalent of a cell of a biological population, right? In biology you have either in, in in mammals you have like, you know, hundreds of thousands of Purkinje neurons. They, they all have some overall commonalities but each of them individually is slightly different so you have a population. Or in the invertebrates you have this one cell type that you can look at a population across different animals and you see variability. And, and uh, I would argue that, uh, you know, ha working on an individual model neuron and studying that in detail has a lot of value and I think should absolutely continue. But there may be some question, questions where we may be better off in working with, with a whole ensemble because if you, if you ask what ha what, what's the role of the sodium current, what if I switch it off, what will happen? If you do that in one neuron, in one model you might arrive at some conclusion that may be idiosyncratic just to that particular version but if you do it across an ensemble that mimics the biological variability and you see that okay 95% of the cases it has this effect and then there are some outliers you get a more robust sense of kind of what's going on. Uh, and this term, I w I, when we first started thinking about it that way I thought that can't be a unique thing to neuroscience. You know that's got to be any complex system, biology or otherwise must have that, that same uh, property that probably there are different parameter combinations can, that can do the same thing and so I started kind of looking around a little bit to see if in any field people kind of were using that and, and were actively exploiting that and it turns out that people who, mo who model metabolic pathways in the body and in cells, they often, you know, they know we have these kind of starting substrates and we have this end product but there are a couple of different kinetic, uh, different chemical pathways that could lead from X to Y. And 
as long as they don't have the complete knowledge of what are those, what is the actual pathway in place in the cell, they often kind of examine all possible pathways and they call it an ensemble. And so that's where that term is coming from. And I already kind of alluded to the biological implications and that is if, it, if there was a unique solution, you have to sit in exactly this parameter spot to generate a pyloric rhythm that would make the system very brittle, the biological system, right? Any small variation could probably kick you out of proper function. But if you have an entire solution space, you know, that makes you much more robust. There may be directions in which you still can easily fall out of your solution space, but there may be other directions where you can vary a parameter a lot and uh, it doesn't really matter and you still produce a functional rhythm. So I think and that's the whole connection with the homeostasis that I talked about on, on Wednesday is that um, we think that these systems have evolved to kind of promote robustness in that they, you know, they are, um, they are non-unique in their parameters. They can do the same job in many different ways. Did you want to ask something? No, just scratching. Okay, so before I move on, I just wanted to mention that uh, so this is one way of exploring a parameter space and how the behavior of a system depends on the parameters. There are other ways uh, and other ways that people use to find parameter sets that produce um, correct activity. One of them is gradient descent. So you take your model and you define some kind of a fitness function. For example, you say, I'm going to say that the period, you know, the fitness is highest if the period is this value and it falls off as I go away from that target value and then you, you have your parameter space and you define that fitness function over the parameter space and you do some kind of gradient descent to find an optimum, either a peak of fitness or a minimum of error. And uh, people often do that, they take like a voltage trace recorded from a biological neuron and they take their model neuron and they try to do a gradient descent to get the model neuron to exactly match that voltage trace. And uh, in some cases it succeeds, but it's a whole field of the literature. And I think one of the reasons is that with neurons, because they have these spiky, you know, unique events going on, it's, it's very difficult to define a fitness function in a way that, that doesn't lead to a lot of jagged features in the parameter, in the fitness surface. And if you have a lot of kind of jagged features and local minima, then gradient descent is very difficult to do. But another method that uh, people do a lot and I think is, I think is more successful than gradient descent stuff and is also very interesting, I think, is, is this kind of uh, evolutionary algorithm or genetic algorithm. Who knows what a genetic algorithm is? Quite a few, yeah. So I don't have to go into a lot of detail. So the idea is that you start with some initial population and now what I mean by population is each individual is now a parameter set, right? So you start with a bunch of random parameter sets of your model and, uh, and then you again have to define some kind of fitness like how well does it match my biological behavior and you pick your champions and uh, you breed them and you do some mutation and you go, sh go through a couple of cycles that try to mimic biological evolution and you narrow down on parameter sets that match your biological behavior well. And that is actually done a lot and, and uh, matches pretty, often matches pretty well. And uh, coming back to that issue that I talked about at the beginning, you know, we looked at eight or 10 in my lab and in other labs we're now up to like 20 or 30 parameters that we're systematically exploring the space of, but then there's a limit, right? The more you add, at some point it becomes computationally not feasible. And so what I think is an, a very interesting approach and in the lab of Eric de Schuter has kind of pioneered that is to do then kind of a hybrid thing. So what they have a really interesting paper that basically starts with an evolutionary algorithm on a very complex multi-compartment Purkinje cell model neuron. And they have, they run their evolutionary algorithm and they arrive, I think they, they picked like the 20 best parameter sets. And then they use those as anchor points for a systematic exploration, uh, more like, uh, more like the, 
systematic exploration that I showed you. So they basically, out of those 20, they picked three, and that anchors a hyperplane in parameter space, and now they systematically explore on that, on that hyperplane. So kind of hybrid approaches like that, I think, are really interesting where you have the best of both worlds. You, you don't have an explosive amount of computation because you start with a couple of already pretty highly evolved individuals, but then you, you can have the fine-grained exploration that you can do with a grid. Okay, so I could stop here. There's, uh, there's lots of other stuff, but I mean, we need to have lunch break. So I can, if anybody's interested in really kind of pursuing this kind of stuff, I, I'm happy to, you know, email or talk while I'm still here, so. I'm interested, uh, so. You're interested. <laughs> Say again, I couldn't hear. Well, I don't know, just, well, I was just wondering, we could, we could maybe, could we, I mean, because there's no, there's no sort of project time or something, I mean, we could, yes, there is. is. Okay. Yeah. No, no, there's a lab, but there's, there's, after the lab, there was, well, I mean, there's, well, there's lots, but <laughs> maybe I'll, I'll do this w like a five minute thing just because that's what people always ask is, so what is that solution space? It, yeah, right. So what is that shape of that solution space? Is it little islands scattered all over? I think this died again. Is it little islands scattered all over the parameter space? Or is it one continuous blob? Or is it a, a few small areas? And is it nice and con convex, or can it have concave features? And I already gave away, often they, they do have kind of concave features. But how do we do that? Like these are high dimensional parameter spaces, so how do you visualize and analyze that? So he here's one method that we came up to visualize this, and this really benefits from this regular grid structure. This is doable, but harder to do if you have kind of a more scattered population of parameter sets. So this is called dimensional stacking. So let me take you through what that is and then I think I can wrap it up there. So say you had a two-dimensional parameter space, sodium and delayed rectifier conductance, and you cover that with a grid of say 100 or in this case 36 simulations, six by six, then you can easily visualize that you could, for example, make all the spiking versions red and make all the bursting ones blue and, and look at just how is it distributed in this two-dimensional thing. So that would be the thing at the top. Now if you have four dimensions, the, the idea of dimensional stacking is, is that you do these little two-dimensional plots and now you stack, you use the next two parameters to stack those inside of, inside of the next dimension, right? So this little red box, your first two parameters, in this case, calcium dependent potassium and sodium are varying in these little squares. And now you repeat that, um, but for the next higher value of the delayed rectifier, right? So you stack, you stack that first two, di two dimensions inside the next two dimensions. And for this eight-dimensional uh, data set that the single neuron database contained, you have to do four levels of that. And now you basically arrive at a two-dimensional plot where every pixel stands for one entry in the database, one set of parameters. So they're all present, but they're arranged in this particular way based on those parameters. And what does that look like? So here's your first dimensional stack that you're looking at. Um, and when you first look at it, you don't see anything, right? But uh, let me take you through it. So these bars here indicate which of the parameters are at which level of organization. So this calcium-dependent calcium potassium here is this biggest level, highest level of organization. So here, calcium-dependent potassium is zero. Here it's one, two, and so on. And the same vertically, you can't see it here, I think it says sodium. And then this is the next level of organization, zero, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. And color coded is that breakdown I had before, whether it's silent in gray or tonic in blue or 
bursting in green through red by number of spikes per burst. And now you can start drawing conclusions, right? First of all, you notice if your calcium dependent potassium and your sodium are at their lowest value, are at zero, then almost you're almost uh, for, you're almost sure to be silent. It's very hard to do anything other than silence if you don't have a sodium current. Um, and then you see that inside these, block, inside these blocks, as you go from here to here, you go to higher and higher numbers of spikes per burst. So what does that mean? That means you go from second level of organization, you go from high um, transient calcium and low delayed rectifier to low transient calcium and high delayed rectifier. So if you vary those two conductances in that direction, you increase your number of spikes per burst. And so you see how you can kind of learn something about the structure of these, uh, of these spaces that way. And uh, some of you have probably realized that what you are going to see in these plots depends a lot on who you put at which level of organization, but I'm not going to talk about that. And so the final thing then is, um, well, let's not even talk about that. I think, I think that's, uh, that's probably enough. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, so if you've got kind of items of solutions in the parameter space, and like we were talking about in your previous talk, uh, if you want to come inside connect, come inside connect as much, uh, can you jump between these? How, how does it know that it's going the right way? Yeah, so I guess I should have finished this last thought. So what, what this was basically going to show here is that we did a connectivity analysis and we asked, if I take a subset that generates a certain behavior, like bursting with a certain period, is it in fact in separate islands or is it connected? And it turns out that unless you do a very narrowly, really narrowly constrained behavior, these things tend to be all connected in a continuous um, area of parameter space, in a continuous solution space. That doesn't mean a nice blob, but you can have a complex shape, but they tend to be connected. And then, so we have a paper with a former postdoc of mine where we, we asked exactly that question. So we were basically looking at a very simple model in that case that had just two dimensions. And uh, what he was mapping out, Andre Oliver is his name, these were two conductances. I don't even remember what they were exactly. And he found that there is a, a solution space that's shaped like this were in here the neuron could generate the kind of oscillation that we were looking for. Over here it was silent, stuck at hyperpolarized, and here it was in depolarization block with some kind of thing like that. And then you were asking how does a homeostatic mechanism know where to go, basically. We then kind of implemented very simple versions of a homeostatic mechanism that would uh, basically move the system on linear trajectories through parameter space until a certain uh, calcium concentration had been reached. So, um, which was high in this area and low in these other areas. And so it turned out then that with this kind of regulatory mechanism, which I think was relatively realistic in, in its overall geometry, you can set up the home a homeostatic mechanism that no matter where you are over here, if you get perturbed out of here, it will always take you somewhere inside the solution space. But if you get perturbed over here, it will never be able to get you back into the solution space. And this is a very abstract model, but uh, some epilepsy people kind of were interested in that and said, well, maybe this could explain how, you know, some kinds of insults to your brain can be overcome by homeostasis and others might be so massive that you will never be able to go back into your solution space. But all of this is, you know, partially very abstract and uh, just because we just don't have the data yet um, and also maybe a little speculative at this point, right? Okay. Yeah. There's a question that Sasha asked. Um, so you said that 
yeah, if you take the animals and the diversity between animals, is that just because it's kind of random where it ends up, or does this reflect some kind of history? Yeah. Um, we have not systematically explored that, but I think he had a good point in that you have kind of animal models where you have these highly inbred lab strains, and and then you have our kind of model that we get from the fishermen, and you know they catch them in the ocean sometime in this place, sometime in that place, and who knows what life history they had in terms of what they were exposed to, and. Just uh, anecdotally, I think he's right that these lab strains that all come from the same background with the same, you know, similar genetics and the same life history, they tend to be more similar than, than animals like that. So I think there may be a point to that, that uh, variability, the extent of the variability may depend on the previous history of the animal. And if we have that, if we have that idea and if it's true that that these homeostatic mechanism are cons mechanisms are constantly operating and are constantly moving a system around in parameter space, then that would make total sense, right? Then where, you're, where exactly you sit in solution space may, a lot, may depend a lot on where you came from. And yeah, so but, but there's no real hard data to kind of make a strong link between the two. So neurons could be functionally stable, but they could actually be moving around this parameter space. Yeah. Minute, hour by hour, right, and that is also, there is also practically no data on that, and that is simply for technical reasons, like a lo doing a longitudinal study on what are a neuron's parameters over a homeostatic time scale, which is days and weeks. It's very difficult either with electrophysiology or with molecular biology. Yeah.